Great. Well, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, so so we'll get started. Uh, this is John Driscoll, General Manager for Boston Engineering. Appreciate you spending 30 minutes with us today. Um, excited to go through. This is a part two of a series. We do have the previous recording available for a thermal analysis that uh, we'll uh, showcase or let you know where you can find that. But um, today we'll be demonstrating uh, the technology that ETC and ANSYS are, are brought to the market with Creo Simulation Live. Did want to um, make sure the folks that might be new to Boston Engineering to learn a little bit about us, uh, the unique capabilities that we bring to our clients in the sense that um, in addition to uh, providing support for customers that are using PTC solutions, um, we are also a customer and user of the technology as well in many facets to commercialize some of our technology. Um, and. Uh, have been using simulation for, for a number of years, uh, incorporated in 1995 uh, and became a partner of PTC in 2006 and um, are excited now to also become a, an ANSYS solution partner uh, recently within the last uh, year as well. So um, excited to have you guys on board and I think uh, you'll get a lot of value out of today's presentation. Um, from the standpoint of just credibility, the simulation is a critical piece to our product development process. Um, and the partnership with PTC and ANSYS um, have been exciting and uh, a lot of new technologies coming to market, but most importantly, uh, we need to make sure our users and folks like yourself that are on the call, um, it's ready for production, it can be used, and, and that's our role uh, on these particular calls to help you guys with adoption, uh, understanding of what capabilities are available, and most uh, make sure that you guys are successful. Uh, with the investments, if you've already purchase simulation live or if you're uh, entertaining to see if it could be beneficial in your product development process. Very quickly, um, we'll do a demonstration. Terry's going to be delivering that. As I noted before, we did deliver a structural uh, Creo Simulation Live webinar back on uh, March in March. We do have that recording available on that link below. Um, if you have any questions, we can obviously send it out to you individually. And today we'll be covering thermal and modal analysis. And uh, ultimately, uh, Creo Simulation Live uh, derives a lot of value, has a unique value prop, and uh, looking to really bring the design process or simulation process, I should say, uh, more upfront into the the uh, in the design process. So, uh, and then we'll we'll wrap up with Jim Shaw and Terry and Don and a couple others. We'll be available for a Q and A question. Um, so, please feel free to to post any questions throughout the the webinar. And um, we'll make sure we capture those toward the end. Very quickly, um, hopefully many of you are aware that uh, PTC and ANSYS a couple of years ago had uh, you know, finalized this strategic partnership where PTC simulation tools and the solvers and the meshing and the simulation capabilities, you know, PTC strategy is to have ANSYS uh, as that under the hood um, simulation solver technology. So we're excited about that. And, um, you know, the uh, Creo 7, as you know, just became available and um, even more capabilities and some new technologies coming to the market. So we're excited to talk about that as well. All right, John, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you great, Jim. Fantastic. So um, thanks uh, for the intro there, John. Uh, my name is Jim Shaw. I've been simulating within uh, PDC ANSYS for uh, about 20 years now. And what I wanted to do before Terry jumps in is just talk a little bit about the landscape right now and the partnership that uh, that John just mentioned between PDC and ANSYS. Um, as was announced at the PDC LiveWorks event a few uh, years ago now, um, PDC and ANSYS have uh, begun a partnership at the, the highest possible level and are working together to um, get the tools to be working for the customers, they realize that they have a lot of customer overlap. And so what we see here are uh, basically the two brands and sort of three different levels, if you will, of simulation. Uh, the first column, the orange column there, we would call that maybe sort of immediate results or instant results. And is really meant for the conceptual, conceptual design phase. So earlier on uh, in that top corner there, the PDC Creo Simulation Live, that's what we're gonna be going through today. Um, and then that, really what's actually happening underneath the hood, the, the solver, the technology, uh, the GPU-based uh, uh, code, that is all from the ANSYS Discovery Live product, 
uh, which was launched just a little bit before PPC Creo Simulation Live. So as ANSYS is continuing to develop their Discovery Live capability, uh, within say a year or so, um, it gets put into uh, PTC Creo Simulation Live, which is embedded within the PTC Creo environment. Uh, and we'll see that hands on here in a second. Um, at the mid tier, if you will, or the middle market, or the sort of um, the next level, if you will, would be what we call, I would say, entry level simulation or mi middle level simulation. I don't want to belittle it by any means, uh, it's very powerful. Um, I would say that it's quote unquote limited in its ability to customize. And that's kind of how personally I separate what I would consider maybe an entry level versus an advanced level, right? So entry level, PTC Creo Simulate and in the ANSYS product line, what they call uh, the ANSYS Discovery AIM. So um, phenomenal tools, lots of physics, right? Thermal, modal, dynamics, nonlinear contact. Um, it parametrically ties into your geometry, um, but it is you have full control over the mesh. You can tweak the mesh. You've got mesh um, sensitivity studies that you can do. So it is a little bit more interactive and has a deeper bench than um, the, the Creo Simulation Live and Discovery Live products. Um, if you're looking for quote unquote infinite customization, right? So I've got test data. I want to correlate my test data within 2% that I may need to lift the hood of the code and script or code or really automate or even um, you know, tweak, if you will, the physics, then um, PTC, of course, you know, hasn't necessarily had that under its, uh, its brand. And so it has partnered historically with a variety of different companies, including and very much so ANSYS. So I know a lot of people use uh, that flagship ANSYS Fluent or ANSYS Mechanical FEA with PTC, very powerful combination. Uh, PTC also has other partnerships with other CFD, FEA, um, uh, mold, uh, mold design and, and fluid flow analysis tools. Uh, so this, this is kind of the landscape we're going to be staying today in that upper left hand corner uh, for Creo Simulation Live. And then John, let's talk about the hardware requirements real quick, just because the technology of the Creo Simulation Live um, is that the solver is really all on the GPU, right? So that's the graphics processor, not the, uh, the actual CPU that we're really used to in traditional FEA and CFD. What that means is we're actually solving and post-processing at the same exact time, right? We have to use the, the graphics card to do the post-processing. By putting those two processes on the same uh, GPU at the same exact time, that gives us that sort of instant or instantaneous or immediate results that Terry's gonna show us. What that does though is re it requires us to have a high-end a high video card. Uh, minimum is, is four gigs and um, you know, six, eight gigs would be recommended. So uh, with that, um, Terry, let's, uh, let's do it. Okay, thank you, Jim. I had to unmute myself. I was talking to myself and that's not usually a good conversation that I have. But this morning, uh, like Jim said, we're gonna talk about thermal and we're also gonna talk about modal analysis as it comes out of Creo Simulate Live. Something that I want to emphasize that Creo Simulate Live is not a replacement for the full-blown uh, analysis package. It's like Jim says, we're going to be in the upper left corner. We're going to be looking at the one that's going to give the designer or the engineer a, a real-time rapid feedback to get them to a position where their design is much more optimized than it would normally be. And you'll see with the speed of this how uh, hopefully it will help you improve your design process by being able to get those results back without having to go through the setting up of the mesh, the compiling of it, the running of the equations uh, and the like. So to start with, I wanna do the uh, thermal uh, analysis. Here we have an engine block and we're just gonna do a temperature analysis. Uh, we have set up some uh, additional conditions here, but to get into simulate live which jim said uh, is included with creo parametric we just click on our live simulations tab and like jim said we can do structured thermal and modal and that's just all under the add simulation and it gives you the structured thermal or modal tab whichever one you want to do uh, i have already created uh, a thermal analysis that we're going to look at this so if i just click on my conduction conditions and just do an edit the definition so you can see what's going on. All of the surfaces that you see in green, uh, we have selected those surfaces. Uh, we have applied a convection coefficient to those and we have applied a bulk temperature to those. Now there is a condition that I will do momentarily where we're going to make a change 
and I will explain that change, but we're gonna do exactly the same thing there. So here, all of those green surfaces have a conduction coefficient and a bulk temperature of 25 associated with those. Now, I wanna go in and I want to apply a load to this, so I come up into my ribbon and I apply a heat flow load, and I pick the surface that I wish to apply it to, that green surface there, and I want that to be 1,000 watts. So I just go in and I put in 1,000, and again, just hit my drop down and specify the units that I want to have. And believe it or not, that's all we have to do. We have our boundary conditions with our convection set up. We've just applied our heat load to it. I hit OK, and this is going to start running. Now, those little triangles that you see there, those are just indications that we have uh, mode uh, associated with it. So once we have specified what we want to do, we just click on our simulate icon in the model and notice we begin getting temperatures back immediately, almost instantaneously. Uh, I will go into my results options here. And the first thing I'm going to do is click on this little icon here in the upper right, turn off those so that we can get a little bit more of a uh, clear view of what we're looking at. Uh, also, the type of information we get. Right now we're looking at a surface, so it's giving us the surface temperatures that we have. We can go in and we can do a composite, and a composite will actually look through the entire model. If you look, you can kind of see how it's transparent and you can see through the model. So we can get a composite temperature. The other thing that we can get is there's something called an inverse surface. And if I click on the inverse surface, it in essence shows me the temperature on the inner surface. This particular engine doesn't have a head on it, so we could see into the cylinders. But if this had a head on it, or it was closed, or it was an enclosed body, we could use inverse surface to see through that outer surface into the inner surface and to see what the temperature was. So I will take this back to surface just so that we're looking at the uh, exteriors. We can change our units to uh, Fahrenheit, Kelvin, whichever we prefer. Uh, we have a show min max button. Uh, it will show us a red circle, and this is the maximum temperature location, and we have a minimum temperature location. A couple of other things we can do is we have what's called a simulation probe. We can take this simulation probe, go in, and now we can get the specific temperature on a point. So let's say I want to know what the temperature is at that point. It's 149.109 degrees C. And if I actually click on details, it will give me the X, Y, and Z coordinates of that specific point. So if there's a point out there that you need to know the temperature of, you can create that point uh, ahead of time. Now, you can save this so that as you do your analysis, uh, those numbers will regenerate and you're always talking about the same number. And that's what I have did here and here, uh, these two little plus signs. And I'm gonna close this and I'm gonna expand these. And they're not exactly the same, but they're in the same ballpark because they're in the same color band. One's 140.616 and one's 140.611. Uh, you'll notice that we're looking at the inside of these water jackets. The reason I did that is I have a condition where I added a coefficient of uh, conduction coefficient and a temperature in here as if water were going through this to cool it. Now you notice I just resumed that and it immediately went in and recalculated. We were at 150 degrees a minute ago with temperatures of 140. Now that we've gone in and we've applied the, the cooling condition to this water jacket, we are now down to 106, 107 and 125. And the reason that I saved those two points that were, they were almost identical before, which they should have been, they were both air. Now you can see how making a slight change can instantaneously give you back a result that in a true FEA analysis package may take you um, hours if not longer to go in, depending on how complicated your model is. And again, here we're looking at an assembly. Something else that we can do here, and this happens in both the uh, structure and the modal as well, and I'll show it to you in modal, is we have a simulation report. It basically is like the info page, if you're familiar with Creo, it's gonna give you the model name, and in this case, it gives us all the models that are used to make up our assembly. It's gonna tell us what all of those materials are. 
It's going to give us the analysis name that we're creating. It will give us our boundary conditions. What's the type of the boundary condition and the value? What are our ambient conditions? And then what are those values? What loads have we applied? We applied a heat flow load of 1,000 watts. And then what are our results? What's our temperature? What's our maximum temperature? Where is it located? Our minimum temperature? Where is it located? And again, it'll show you maximum and minimum. And then you, again, it's going to take a snapshot of anything that I have sitting out there. So those are also are recorded um, for uh, the HTML page with all the information on it. That's pretty much the thermal uh, presentation that I wanted to give to you this morning. Uh, Jim, do you have anything that uh, that you would like to add to that before I move on and go into the uh, modal? Yeah, I'll just say one thing. So right on that ribbon up top there, um, Terry was showing us temperature and convection and, co and, 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 uh, and conduction. So this is still an FEA solver. So we're really only solving uh, heat flow through the solid. We're, we're really only solving for conduction, but we can we can account for convection um, uh, through just the convection coefficient, like like Terry showed uh, on, on the water jacket there. So just just to keep in mind, this is this isn't any different than uh, some of the, the capabilities that we're used to and some of the Creo Simulate stuff, where we're, we're solving for conduction, but we can account for um, you know heat loss to air and things like that. So awesome, thanks, Terry. Okay, so now let's go do a modal analysis. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Uh, here we have a valve cover. And we want to do a modal analysis on this. We want to determine the natural frequency uh, of this component. So why would you want to solve for natural frequency? Well, you've got an engine that's running, and it's going to be generating some frequency. And as objects get close to their natural frequency, they generate what's called resonance. And in essence, they um, multiply themselves until they get to the point of failure. I um, was speaking with a couple of individuals earlier today uh, about uh, natural frequencies, and we brought up Galloping Gertie, uh, if any of you are familiar with it. It is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge that they built out uh, in uh, out, out west in, uh, I think it's Washington State. And what happened was they took, in all, took into account all the engineering. Just for some reason, they didn't take into account a specific wind speed at a specific direction, and it actually caused the bridge to get into resonance. And if you've seen the bridge galloping like a wave, it eventually destroyed itself. And so when we're designing parts, we don't want to have our parts anywhere near the natural frequency uh, that they're dealing with. So here I have a valve cover, and we're going to run a modal analysis on it. So I click on uh, the modal analysis that I already have in here. And I need some constraints on it. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to do a fixed constraint. Now, you can run a modal analysis without any constraints. But because this object is actually going to be bolted to um, the actual engine itself, we're going to fix all of these hole locations as if they were bolted. And then we're going to run our analysis. Will not take very long. It will actually take me longer to pick these holes and make sure that they are locked and it will to do the analysis because once I hit the go button, we pretty much are gonna be where we need to be with the analysis. So one more here at the bottom, select that, say okay. Okay, so I have my icons just to make sure, expand my constraints, they're fixed. Okay, so I have now fixed that. That's the only requirement we need to run a modal analysis on this particular part. So I come up and I click on simulate and oops, live simulation cannot be run, material missing. Imagine that. And yes, I did this on purpose. <laughs> uh, I did it to show you that you do not have to go all the way back out to Creo in order to make any changes to this model. If you'll look on the left in your tree, let me hit close here. You have your simulation tree of everything that's going on up here. And then you have your model tree down here to the bottom. Now, typically the material would be specified in your preparation when you're creating your model initially. So it would have a material associated with it. This particular case, we have a multitude of materials associated with this and it doesn't know which one to run. So I'm just going to pick the aluminum 2024 and I click on assign. I've now assigned that material 
I now click on run and here we go. Now, the modal analysis will take longer than any of the others, but still it's much, much faster than what you would expect if you were to be running the full-blown uh, ANSYS or Creo Simulate uh, software. So this has come back and this has given us a natural frequency of roughly 826 hertz. We can look at this, we can actually go into our results and we can look at the deformation. We can, that's mode surface four. We can look at modal surface one. We can play those analyses. So we stop this one. We can go back and we can set this to four and we can play that one. So that's just a different mode shape and that's moving this tab down here on the bottom. So we have all of that going on. Now, a couple of things that we can do to change this. One is I have a couple of ribs that are here. We can take these ribs and we can suppress them and see what that does to our analysis. So now the ribs are gone. Again, notice it instantaneously kicks off and it's gonna come back and it's gonna give us a new number. Uh, so it's, it's counting down now as it's going through and doing this. Actually, I'm still in deformation. Let me stop that, stop the deformation. There we go. So I've taken the ribs out. Now, the material that you use can be very uh, contributing to the natural frequency or to any of the, the conditions that you're looking for in your analysis. So what we can do in our analysis is we can go back in and I'm gonna change this over to ductile iron. I'm gonna tell it I want it to rerun it. And it's gonna rerun, it's gonna give us some numbers here uh, momentarily. So it looks like it's leveling out at about 17.02. And so if I change this from ductile from excuse me from iron ductile to magnesium it goes through and runs it again calculates it down and we get to uh, a different number so if you are designing a component and you want to know what kind of effect different materials will have you can make that change this fast uh, it doesn't have to be that you're looking for the natural frequency of an object you could be looking at the temperature that we looked at on the thermal analysis and you can make the model change or you can make the, temper, the temperature or material change and see what would happen there. So you can change that material at any time you wish. I mean, let's just go, just for the sake of argument, let's change it to titanium and let it run through. A couple of things that while this is running, uh, I'll show you in the simulation report. If I click on the simulation report, it's gonna look just like the other one did. The one thing, that it will do uh, is uh, when it finishes calculating is you will see all of your mode shapes at the bottom. The uh, simulation probe allows you to go and, and specify you know, a frequency if you, if you so wish. So again, let's say I wanted to change my maximum over here and I grab this and I pull it down. I can go in and have it change the uh, region of what the color bands are. And again, I can click on the little arrow chasing itself and it will reset it. I don't have to remember what those were. Um, I will zoom in right here just to show you we have distinct color bands. If I click on the legend little color field at the bottom, it will blend those colors. That is purely cosmetic. It has absolutely no effect on the analysis or the numbers. It is just a cosmetic representation that, you know, some people like to see the blended colors if they're going to uh, be presenting this to someone uh, in a presentation, as opposed to seeing just the strict uh, distinct color bands. That pretty much completes the demonstration that I have. I will um, open it up for questions now. Feel free to ask any question. Uh, Jim's here, I'm here. Uh, like John said earlier, Don's here. So um, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have.
Awesome. Thank you, Terry. Very cool. Um, I just got a couple of questions, mostly around the, the modal analysis here, more so than the thermal. Maybe uh, that means everybody's all set with the, the thermal. One of the questions I have is what's the difference between a constrained and an under-constrained modal analysis? And um, a, a modal analysis without any constraints would be um, applicable, for example, if you were looking at an aircraft fuselage or a submarine uh, structure where there really is no constraints. Those are those are structures that are really just sort of floating in a fluid, if you will. Um, and it's very important to understand what the, the, the natural frequencies of those structures are, uh, particularly due to some of the, the, the cyclical loading that we see from turbulence whether it's in air and water. Um, so that would be uh, that would be an example of an, under, uh, an unconstrained mobile analysis. And of course, the uh, the valve cover here constrained. Many times we're we're analyzing a bracket or an assembly or a structure, and it's bolted to some you know larger structure or bolted to the ground uh, for seismic or something. And so um, we really want to have those uh, those parts. Um, in that application. Other than that, the modal analysis is really just giving us those natural frequencies. Um, so that's uh, that's constrained versus unconstrained. Um, one thing I did kind of notice, and I don't know if anyone else is picking up on it, but the, just the way the GPU solver works here, when, when Terry hit that simulate button um, and we start getting results from that modal analysis, it starts with a somewhat of a higher frequency. Um, and then sort of you, you give it a few more seconds and it starts to come down a little bit um, and, and starts to converge on a lower number. And I, I kind of liken that to if you're, if you're familiar with ANSYS, uh, uh, whether it's ANSYS Mechanical or um, or ANSYS AIM or Creo Simulate, um, think of it as starting off with a coarse mesh uh, in a way, and then sort of over time as you as you converge on a tighter, tighter mesh. So th that's all happening automatically. Um, there's not a traditional mesh uh, in in Creo Simulate Live uh, as as there is in, a, in an FEA tool. So we get to we get all that time back, right? We don't have to be sitting there doing all the mesh sensitivity studies and whatnot. Um, it is, in a way, sort of doing the same same type of math process. Um, and then one other question that popped up on the modal um, was, um, are we getting actual deflections? And the answer to that is no. So uh, when Terry shows, Terry, can we, can we look at the um, results options for this one again? And can we go to the first mode? I think we've got, yeah, we've got mode four up. Let's go to the first mode. We'll see that. So. What we're looking at right now is just a relative displacement, right? We're just trying to get sort of a qualitative look, if you will, at what would move, where in the structure would we resonate? Um, and so um, we don't get any actual deflections. To get an actual deflection, we would then go into, from here, you know, it would, you, you would either go into Creo Simulate or, or, or ANSYS, or, or maybe if you're, um, you don't know those tools, you hand it off to your, to your colleague, uh, who operates in those tools every day, and then they would run the full dynamic analysis, right? And so they would put in sort of the frequency, the magnitude, and the amplitude of the vibration, and then we would get out of that dynamic analysis of uh, real deflections, real velocities, real accelerations, the stresses, and things like that. So right now, uh, this modal analysis is just going to give us a relative uh, deflection and, and show us what that mode is going to be. Uh, we do have a couple more questions here. Um, so um, we have a question, was this thermal fluid simulation being done in Creo flow analysis, aka Samaric CFD or with an ANSYS CFD tool? So um, this thermal analysis was, was only done in Creo Simulate Live. Uh, there's no fluid elements, there's no meshing of the air or anything around the, um, uh, the engine block. Uh, and so that was all done natively in Creo Simulate Live. If you wanted to, you know, build a box of air around your engine block or or uh, or or uh, mesh the water within the water jacket, that would require a full-blown CFD tool. So you could use Samaric CFD, which is the the CFD partner of PTC, uh, or you could also use Fluent or CFX, which are the native CFD tools uh, within the ANSYS, what we call the flagship. That was the far right-hand side. You could also use the ANSYS Discovery uh, AIM tool, which does have CFD capability as well. So for right now, as I mentioned, um, this is this was just a conduction analysis, and we're just accounting for convection uh, with a with a convection um, film film coefficient or a convection radiation. Uh, excuse me, convection coefficient. Um, another question here is: Can we run conjugate heat transfer analysis in Creo 7? So it's very very similar. Conjugate heat transfer, meaning conduction, convection, and radiation. So to do that full blown. 
uh, thermal analysis, we would need to mesh and account for the fluid, air, water, or whatever. And so that is going to require a full-blown CFD tool. However, I will say that uh, coming up on May 20th, so just in two weeks from today, uh, we will be showcasing um, Creo 7 just came out in the last few weeks or a month or two ago. That is um, going to have Creo Simulate Live fluids. And so, um, as I mentioned, underneath the hood of Creo Simulate Live, we have the, it's the using the Discovery Live engine from ANSYS. Uh, ANSYS Discovery Live, that tool does have fluids, um, both external, internal, air, water, you name it. It is a CFD tool. Again, also using the, the GPU solver. So, um, for those who will come from a, a more uh, called traditional CFD tool, to see those results coming so fast uh, is really, really uh, kind of mind boggling, to be honest. Uh, and so uh, right now, uh, this is Creo. I think Terry, what are you in Creo 6? I think Terry's muted. I think Terry's using Creo 6 for the demo here. Um, yeah, Creo this 7 is going to come out. We'll do fluids next month uh, in two weeks. This is Creo 604. Great. Thank you. Um, Give me the presenter real quick. Sorry, Jim. Oh, no worries. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so really looking forward to that. In two weeks' time, we'll do another one. We'll talk about the uh, constant heat transfer analysis using uh, the GPU-based CFD in Creo Simulate Live. Uh, another question. Uh, does Simulate Live use shell elements? No. Uh, Simulate Live is actually discretizing the solid, and that's why um, Terry was able to show you uh, the composite uh, as well as the uh, the surface. Um, I think it was called the inverse surface um, and, and the post processor. So we're actually getting um, we're actually getting uh, real values through the thickness. Uh, we're just getting them displayed on the surface. Um, so it's not uh, it's not meshing like a traditional mesher. Um, it discretizes it a little bit differently. It's not coded like your traditional code that's all sort of derivatives of NASTRAN from the 60s. We're, we're using brand new code from ANSYS that's been uh, written in the last five years. Um, that's being run um, on uh, the code of, um, of CUDA, if you're familiar, uh, which is a, a operating uh, language, if you will, or a system that resides on the GPU. So that's all being discretized on the fly by the GPU through, through the solids. So really, really new, neat stuff. Um, really exciting stuff. Um, yeah, we got a uh, screenshot here. So fluids is coming. Uh, the fluids is really interesting for those who are, uh, are really excited about it. Uh, we've got uh, basically uh, similar to what we would call a lattice Boltzmann. If those are from the CFD world, um, it's really, really fast and it's on the GPU and it's basically running a transient CFD analysis right there on the fly. Really cool stuff. We've got heat transfer. Uh, we've got fluid flow, external, internal water fluid. Uh, water, air, all the good stuff. So that's that's pretty exciting. Um, another, one more question here. Are there any reasons we would need to simplify the model prior to running the study? Nope. That's one of the great um, reasons that Creo Simulate Live and that technology is, is going to help out a designer is we think about when we use a traditional FEA or, or CFD tool and there's a significant amount of time uh, spent in pre-processing, right? So meshing and all the things we need to do to the geometry to get it to play nice in the mesher, to get a quality mesh so that we can get a quality and you know, meaningful result out of that. So um, we typically you know, would say that we spend at least 50% of our time in pre-processing, right? Cleaning up geometry, um, sliver surfaces, small interferences, all that fun stuff, and then building in a box of air around it and all that. So for the FEA stuff, we really, uh, we don't have to worry about any of that. Um, we just hit the go button and it's, and it's discretizing it in, in a new innovative way on the GPU. And uh, we don't really have to worry about it again. However, because of that, uh, it, there's a lot of uh, assumptions that it has to make uh, in the way that it solves it, in the way that it projects the solution. Uh, and so, you know, you're, you may not get correlation to test data within 2%. You might, I mean, you might, if you have a simple problem, again, the CSL is a linear solver. So if you have a linear problem and it's a, 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 a small load on simple geometry with small deflection, it's all linear. Um, you're in, you know, you're in the, you haven't yielded the material. You could easily see correlation to test data. But as you get more complex um, in the case of, for example, uh, that uh, engine block, you're probably not going to get correlated to test data. You're probably going to get something, you know, I don't know, 10% or whatever. Your, your mileage may vary, let's put it that way. So, but no time in doing the pre-processing, which is nice. So, 
that is it. I know we're a little bit over, so I apologize, but those are all the questions from the chat. I don't know if Terry or John, you guys have anything else, but I think I'm all set on my side. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, no, I think uh, this is a great place to stop. We'll have this recorded as we noted. Appreciate you all making the time. And as Joe, uh, Jim noted, we'll be having a follow-up webinar here in a few weeks. And um, appreciate you taking the time. Have a wonderful day. Be safe.